some some number of job postings like applying and completing oh, so you're number of technical interview oh, preparation. There questions. we go. Can you hear me now? Doing that process. Yeah, I can hear you now. Hey Brandon. That process. Bre can Brandon. Have a snowball effect. Like once you're in the middle of that, you can do it more often. There. <laughs> I'll just hit him on mute. David, you found me. I uh I got a notification that you were over at my uh at my other office hour. So at yeah, the I was, I was trying process. to find the, the right one. I was like, oh, I was looking through my emails. No worries. I, I'm sorry. I should probably keep sending that more often. There's two different numbers that you need to have. One of them is for my office hours. And then one of them is for this, which is um, uh, our sort of our regular class meeting times. So you, know, you any, can put them on your website maybe or something. I don't yeah, know. maybe I need to do that because I, yeah, they're buried in some of those emails. I've tried to put it in the emails a few times, but I think you're right. Uh, some people are maybe not quite getting, um, getting those in a handy place. So, um, all right, guys. Well, there's only uh, a few of us here, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and start. This is an optional class anyway. Uh, I, I tried to make that clear. Uh, so we're not going to to do any new material uh, today. Um, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna take some questions on the homework and then I'm gonna just do some practice problems with you, sort of like reviewing more or less, uh, and just sort of see how you feel, if you have any questions, of course. I've currently muted all of you. Uh, so uh, as usual, you can unmute yourself. You just have to make sure that uh, you're either wearing headphones or that it's quiet uh, in the background uh, so that we can hear you clearly without without anything else coming through in, in the background. Um, I'm going to send an email uh, again to sort of talk about Thursday and how the midterm is going to work. Uh, we are just going to take the midterm uh, at our regular scheduled class time. Um, I'm going to need everybody to log in to Zoom uh, like you're doing right now. And, um, you know, for the most part, I think everybody will just be on mute the whole time. Uh, there won't be a lot of talking going on. Um, but I will be emailing you the midterm, uh, maybe 15 minutes before noon, approximately. And then you'll have until 2.30 to work on it. Uh, and at that point, you need to send me pictures uh, into a Dropbox folder that I'll send out uh, probably tomorrow, um, a Dropbox folder for your midterm two submission. So you'll need to send me that um, submission um, by 2.30 on Thursday. Um, so that's kind of how, how the midterm is going to work. Um, it, is, it is no notes, no book, no calculator, none of that stuff, just the usual rules that we use. Uh, I want to trust everybody to uh, adhere to those policies, the same policies that we've had all along. I am going to give you the um, Graham-Schmidt formulas. You don't need to memorize those, uh, and I'm sure that there'll be a question or two on the test that has to do with that uh, Graham-Schmidt process. Uh, so don't worry about memorizing those formulas, but do make sure that you know when to use them and how to use them. Um, so uh, that'll be coming up on Thursday. And then I, because we haven't been doing any lectures, well, we're not doing a lecture today and we didn't really do a lecture last Thursday. Uh, I'm going to ask you guys uh, to watch some videos that I'm going to post links for. I'm going to do that after the midterm because I don't want you getting confused or distracted by things that you don't need to worry about right now. Um, but I'll be asking you next week while we're on spring break to watch those videos. And there will be some homework to turn in when we come back on that first Tuesday coming back from spring break. So um, <clears throat> just want you to have a heads up that that will be coming. Um, and I'll, I'll send you emails after the midterm with, you know, sort of here are the videos and here's what you need to watch and here's the homework and all of that. So, so that'll be coming up uh, later. Um, okay, so uh, does anybody have any questions about Thursday, by the way? Uh, maybe I should, before we start into any of the actual math, I should just see, is, is everything clear as to sort of- Hi, Professor. Is yes, is a, do you have a question uh, for me? Yes, so if we can't print the test, is it fine that we open a new tab on our browser and look at the test from that browser, the tab? 
Okay, so you're asking, I'm, I couldn't quite catch that. You're asking if you can just open the exam in a different window yeah. during the exam time instead of printing it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I try to print it, but sometimes my printer don't work. Okay, I, I, let, me, let me just say something really quickly about that. I prefer if you can print the exam. It will be easier for me uh, because then I'll know sort of exactly which page goes with which answers and so on. But if you cannot print the midterm when I email it to you, what you can do is exactly what you suggested, Reza. You can leave the exam open on a, uh, a different tab of your computer and you can work from that. That's totally fine. Okay, and what if uh, I try to print it? Uh, what if our connection in the middle of the test gets disconnected? Uh, so in other words, if you tried to print it, but it didn't work, and so then you wanted to... Um, oh, not the printing, uh, the, our internet connection. Oh, like in, for Zoom. Uh, let, let's hope for the best that that doesn't happen. Um, one thing that you can do is, you know, when you receive the midterm through the email that I send you, what you can do is you can download that to your, uh, to your local machine if you want to. That's totally yeah. fine. That way, if you do lose the internet, at least you have the midterm, you can keep working on it, and hopefully you'll get a reestablished connection pretty quickly so that you can still submit your test on time. Because uh, yesterday I had a, a test similar to this one. I okay. got one disconnected, but I reconnected in like one minute. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. great if you can do that, but in the meantime, uh, it might be a good idea. This is a, gr I'm glad you brought this up. It might be a good idea for you to pull the midterm, which is just going to be a PDF file. It would yeah. be good if you would pull that off of uh, your email and just download it onto your computer because I'm just a little concerned that, um, yeah, if you lost access to your email, uh, and that was the only thing open that had the exam on it, that then you wouldn't be able to work on it. And so um, that's my, my best advice is to download it. And then maybe, yeah, you hopefully can reconnect to the internet within one minute. Uh, but just in case you have a delay, I don't yeah. want you to be delayed working on the test. So uh, try to make sure if you didn't get it printed, try to make sure that you at least have it downloaded over to your computer okay I'll try to send the exam over like at least 15 minutes early maybe a little bit more than that so people can uh, have time to like try to print it and at least get themselves set up the way they want to be yeah. hopefully everything goes fine thank you so much you bet thank you and I hope it does go fine too uh, does anybody else have any questions about how we're going to do the midterm on Thursday feel free to unmute yourself uh, right now you're all muted but does anybody have any questions Okay, uh, like I said, I will follow up with an email with uh, instructions for the whole class. I just wanted to take a moment and give you guys a chance to ask anything. Okay, so the next thing I wanna do is uh, see if you guys have any homework questions. There's a homework assignment that is due today on section 6.1, and this is one of the sections that will be covered on the midterm Thursday. So I want everybody to, uh, do their best to uh, learn this stuff and, and do the homework. So uh, does anybody have any homework questions? This is the homework that's due tonight at 11 o'clock. Problem 36. Okay, problem 36. Th these are all coming out of 6.1. So let me, I'm gonna come over to my board now and try to work on some of these things at the board. Okay, so 36. I'll put it right here. Hopefully you guys can all see, see the board okay from there. Let me know if it's too small or it's blurry or anything like that. Uh, 36 is a good problem. So uh, V, the V right here, this is a vector space. So they gave us that. And then they gave us a basis. So V1, V2, dot, 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 up to Vn. And this it would be, uh, sorry, VK, I guess it is. They're calling it V sub K. This is a basis for V. Okay, so we have a basis for V. 
And then it says, uh, suppose that T goes from V to W, and let's suppose that T is linear. So we have a linear transformation from V to W. Okay, and then they also tell us that T of all of those basis vectors, VI, for each one of those, the transformation of VI equals a zero vector. Of course, that's really the zero vector of W. Okay, and then this is for each I. So T of V1, T of V2, T of V3, all of those uh, are equal to zero. So then it says prove, prove that T of V is equal to zero, again, that's the zero vector of W, for every vector in V. This is kind of getting back to one of the big points I was making on um, Thursday last week, which is that if I tell you what my linear transformation does to the basis vectors within a vector space, then I can tell you what that transformation does to any vector. So this is the whole idea here, is that I've already told you that by assumption, T of V1 is zero, T of V2 is zero, and so on. All of those uh, vectors get transformed to zero. And based on that, they're asking us to show that every vector in the vector space gets transformed to zero. So before I just sort of spit out the answer, I'm wondering if any of you would like to unmute yourself and give me a suggestion. Do you have an idea? How can I show that T of V will be zero? Can you prove that it follows the, it, it obeys addition and multiplication? Uh, so Brendan, very good. I mean, obviously T respects addition and scalar multiplication, and we are gonna use that here. So let's think about how to use that, okay? The key thing here, guys, is that V1 through VK is a basis for V, and that means, in particular, this is a good review for the midterm too, right? What is a basis? A basis is two things. It's a spanning set and it's linearly independent. I wanna focus on the spanning property here, right? So if I take this vector V, I'm gonna just put the proof down here, right? If I just take the vector V and I write it, I'm going to write V, in terms of the basis, right? Because a basis spans everything, so I know that I can do that. So I'm gonna write V as C1 V1 plus C2 V2 and so on, dot, 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 Cn Vn. So I, I, I'm not using the transformation yet. This is just using the basis or particularly the spanning aspect of a basis. So what that allows me to do then, this is exactly what you were suggesting, Brandon, is I can write T of V as T of this whole linear combination. Dot, 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 C, N, V, N. I can just put that into the parentheses there. Okay, so we can certainly do that. And now, T respects linear combinations, right? It respects addition, it respects scalar multiplication. So T respects this expression. I can factor out all the constants. So C1 times T of V1, and I can also break apart the plus signs. C2, T of V2, dot, dot, dot. I'll get out of the way in just a second. Oh, this should be, sorry, I keep messing up the K and the N. Have you noticed that? Uh, I usually like to use N for the basis. Sorry, this should stop at K, just because I wanna be consistent with the book with how the question is phrased. So this is CK. All of these Ns should have been Ks here. Sorry about that. Here we have CK times T of VK. Okay, so that is actually the key step, isn't it? 
where we've busted apart the transformation into separate terms and pulled all the constants out. And why that's the key step? Well, T of V1 is zero, T of V2 is zero. All of these terms, I'm just gonna put dot, dot, dot there because I'm running out of room. All of those terms are just zero. So when you add that all together, of course, the zero vector added to itself over and over and over again just gives us the zero vector. Okay, so that's a great, a great uh, sort of theoretical problem. Uh, I will definitely be asking you a few theoretical questions on the midterm. This is like a nice example of that, using the linearity, the linear properties of T to sort of bust apart this linear combination uh, and prove that T of V is zero. Does that make sense to everyone? So at the very end when we were using the zeros, that's because where where you wrote on the board just above reason, the prove, yes. prove that T of V equals the zero vector. Right. Zero. Well, this is, this is what you're trying to prove. You're trying to prove that T of V is equal to zero, but you are given right up here, one line above it, you are given that T of each VI is zero. So the whole idea then is that T of V1 is zero, T of V2 is zero, and so on. In this last line, you're really just adding the zero vector to itself over and over again. Okay. Is that, is that clear? Yeah. Great, does anybody else have a question about that? Thank you. Sure, you're welcome. Okay, um, very good. I'm glad you asked that problem. That's a nice one uh, from a theoretical perspective to kind of look at. Does anybody wanna ask me any other questions from today's homework assignment? Uh, number 28. 28? Yes. Okay, let me erase the board first and then we'll talk about 28. Okay, 28. I'll put it right here. I have to remember the question. Okay, so we have a transformation on 28 that goes from R4 over to R2. And what they actually want you to do is find the matrix for this. So remember that whenever you have a, a transformation from Rn to Rm, you always get a matrix that's M by N out of that. What will be the size of the matrix that we're looking for here? Two by four? Exactly, two by four. So in fact, let me start giving myself a spot to put the matrix. I'll just write the answer here in the top right corner as we start building it. It's gonna be size two by four. Okay, so now the question is, well, how do you make the matrix? Well, they gave you some information here. They told you that T of one, zero, zero, zero is equal to three comma negative two. And then they told you that T of one, one, zero, zero is equal to five comma one. And then they told you that T of one, one, one and zero is equal to negative one and zero. And then finally, T of one, 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 one is two, two. So this is a really, the key idea here, guys, this is what's really important, is that the columns of the matrix that you're supposed to write down come from figuring out T of the standard basis vectors. So in this problem, they did give you T of one, zero, 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 and that was equal to three, negative two. So that actually becomes the first column of this matrix, three and negative two, okay? So far so good? Yes. <clears throat> now, the, the rest of the columns are a little bit harder because, for example, we have to figure out what is T of zero, one, zero, zero. This is a, a standard basis vector. 
So I have to know what the transformation does to that, and that will be the second column of my matrix. So can you tell me, how am I going to figure out what T of 0, 1, 0, 0 is? Because they didn't give us that one. So T of 1, 1, 0, 0 minus T of 1, 0, 0, 0? Yeah, that's exactly right. You, you, you just have to subtract. So you just notice that this vector is the second one minus the first one. So that's 5, 1 minus 3, negative 2. And when you subtract that, you get 2, comma 3, I believe. And that becomes the second column of your matrix. Is this making sense? Is everybody with me? Yeah. Um, OK, great. Uh, how about the third column? How are we going to do that one? So it will be t of 0, 0, 1, 0. Is that what we'll have to get? That's right. So we need to, for the third column, let me just put this here at the bottom. We need t of 0, 0, 1, 0. And do you see how to make 0, 0, 1, 0 from the given vectors that we have over here? Can anybody help out? So the third one minus the second one? Yeah, that's right. It's just the third, it's just the third vector minus the second vector. So in this case, that would be negative one comma zero minus five comma one, which when you actually subtract it is negative six, negative one. So I'm gonna put that as the third column. Okay, I hope everybody's getting the hang of this. The last column of the matrix is just T of 0, 0, 0, 1. And you can see that that's just going to be the fourth vector minus the third vector. And if you take the fourth vector minus the third vector, you'll get 3 and 2. So that becomes your, your matrix capital A. It's a 2 by 4 matrix. And the columns of this matrix are always just the transformation of the standard basis vectors. OK? Remember that, uh, just as a quick little refresher, guys, you can only sort of represent a transformation with a matrix if that transformation goes from R something to R something. So if we had a problem that involved polynomials or functions or something that wasn't just slots of vectors in Rn, then we couldn't do this approach, right? Uh, we couldn't make a matrix out of it. Um, it. It turns out that you can do that, but we're not talking, that's a math 307 topic. So I'm not going to get into that with you guys, certainly for this exam or anything. Um, the only time that you're going to be thinking about your transformation coming from a matrix is when it's a transformation from Rn to Rm. Okay. All right. Great. Um, does that answer your question, Matt? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay, great. And in this particular case, it was pretty easy to figure out the vectors that we needed from the given information, right? Mm -hmm. I did one last Thursday uh, during our sort of informal class last Thursday, where I think it was a transformation from R3 to R3. It was a little trickier to figure out how to get the standard vectors from the ones that were given in the question. So obviously, it could be very messy in general. You're going to have to trust me, of course, that on a timed test without a calculator on Thursday, if I ask you something like this, I'm going to make it reasonably computationally simple. This example right here is pretty much at the right level. right? You, you have to do a little bit of work here. Right, but it's not too bad. So uh, that's just something to keep in mind um, that, that you could get asked something like that. Okay. Um, does anybody want to ask me any other questions about the homework that's uh, due for tonight? Professor, may I ask you a question from yes. uh, group work nine? From group work nine. Okay, I don't have that in front of me, but you can maybe you can just tell me what the question yeah. it, question was. It says, suppose u, v, and w is an orthogonal set with a norm of u equals to 1. Sorry, uh, slow down just a little bit. Uh, the v, set u, v, v and w, w, this is an orthogonal set 
it norm of u equals to one. Norm of u equals one. Norm of v equals two. Norm of v equals two. And norm of w equals three. Equals and three, they, right. Okay, and then what did they want you to find? Three u minus w, uh, u plus two v plus two w. Okay, so this inner product, right? So we're changing subjects here a little bit, but that's okay. Uh, we've got plenty of time today to, to review and do lots of different things. So let's talk about this one. Okay, so this is good. This is a good one to review. And I know that I've uh, put questions like this on uh, my midterms before. Um, the idea here is that when you're calculating the inner product of this expression, you're allowed to sort of foil it out. Uh, and that's because uh, if you go back to the axioms of an inner product, which I want to make sure everybody remembers those axioms, uh, the four axioms, right? Um, yeah. You know, one of the axioms says you can pull constants out. Um, another axiom says you can break up plus and minus signs. And that's exactly what we need to do here because we have some constants and we have some uh, pluses and minuses and we can use those inner product axioms to totally break this apart, right? So what you're basically going to want to do here is foil this out. I have sort of two terms on the first vector and three terms on the second vector. So when you foil this out, you're actually going to get six terms, right? Two times three. So what will those terms be? Well, the first one, I'm gonna pull the three out and take the inner product of u with itself. And then the next term, I'm gonna take three u with two v. Three and two, they both come out. So that's six times the inner product of u with v. Okay, and then finally, I take the inner product of three u with two w. Again, I can pull out the three and the two. I get the inner product of u with w. Is everybody able to read this so far? Yes. Yeah. So far so good? Yeah. Okay, great. And then I'm gonna continue because I have three more terms. I have a minus, and now I have to take the inner product of w with u, and then minus, here's a factor of two that I can pull out, the inner product of w with v, and then another factor of two that I can pull out, there's still a minus, the inner product of w with w. So this is kind of like foiling the expression out, and you can always do that. And this gives us six terms. Now, to calculate these six terms, the question has to give you the information that you need in order to be able to do that. So for example, they did tell you that you have an orthogonal set of vectors. So if you remember, an orthogonal set of vectors is a set where any two distinct vectors have an inner product of zero. And that allows you to cross off any term that has two different vectors in it. So u and v, u and w, w and u, w and v. Okay, now sometimes people will ask me, well, what if it's not an orthogonal set? If, if the original set was not orthogonal, then the question would have had to give you the information that you need to calculate these four terms that I just crossed off. So it's certainly possible that you would have to calculate those four terms some other way. But in this case, it was an orthogonal set. Okay, so then we only have two terms left. The first term is three times uh, the inner product of u with itself. I'll just remind you, that's just the norm of u squared. And then minus two times the norm of w squared. So when you take the inner product of a vector with itself, you just get the norm of that vector squared. Okay, and now we can just plug in the values. So we have, uh, for the first term, three times one squared, three times one squared, and then minus two times three squared. 
So this becomes uh, 3 minus 18. Negative 15. Negative 15, right? Yes. Okay, does that help? Yes. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. Does anybody else have any question on this example? Okay, great. Um, I think okay, so there's, yeah, question? So why were we able to cross out those four specifically? You mentioned orthogonal set, but. Right, sure so if, if we come back up here, uh, if we have an orthogonal set, what that means is that the inner product of all of these distinct pairs of vectors, they're all zero. That's, that's the definition. Actually, that is the definition of an orthogonal set, is that all of those mutual inner products are zero. So those terms are showing up down here, and we are able to just cross those off. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Cool. Thank Great you. question. Everybody else okay uh, so far with this example? All right, fantastic. Does anybody have any other questions on the homework that's due today? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch that. Did anybody have any questions on any of the other problems that you guys are working on for tonight? So far, so good. Okay, uh, I, I wanna remind you guys also that um, in my midterm review packet, I have some, um, some special office hours. Uh, my virtual office hours have been working great. Like I literally will turn my computer on and I'll open the office hour meeting room. Uh, remember, that's not this meeting room, that's my office hour meeting room. I'll, I'll open that room up and I'll just leave it in the background uh, and I'll wander around my house and if I hear the, the little chime, somebody coming in, no, oh, then I just go over to my computer and I see who's there and we just talk. Um, it works really well. So uh, feel free uh, to take advantage of that. I have office hours today after we're done with this class. Uh, and also later on tonight. Um, these office hours are all listed in my review packet, okay? As of right now, so it turns out tomorrow I might go out a little bit. It's actually my birthday tomorrow, so I'm gonna try to uh, go do something, maybe go on a hike or whatever for a little bit of time. Um, but if I'm around, I'll definitely let you guys know uh, about that. I have some office hours on Thursday morning as well, so before the exam, uh, thanks, guys. I see your Happy birthday, notes. Professor. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so I, I might go out for a little while tomorrow to just uh, have a little bit of fun, but I will be around uh, Thursday also in the morning. So before the exam starts, uh, you can come on in with any last minute questions. I'll probably just turn on my computer, turn on the Zoom, and just uh, do whatever I want in the house. And if I hear somebody come in to ask a question or go over anything, yeah, I'll be glad to do it. Um, I'll keep my whiteboard handy uh, for that session. Like if you, let's say you're studying for the test and you're like, oh, Dr. Ann, and I don't remember how to uh, check the inner product axioms or something like that. I can just real quick throw a problem on the board here. We can practice and uh, kind of get, get a little bit of uh, an efficient way of, of uh, working on things. So feel free to, uh, to jump in with, with my office hours. Okay, but I'm gonna do some practice right now. Unless there's any other questions about the homework, I'll give you another one more chance to ask if you have any so far. Um, I will post the answers to that homework assignment later tonight as well, so you'll be able to, to, check, to check that out. But in the meantime, I think what I'll do right now is I'm just, we have plenty of time. I may not use the whole time actually, to be honest with you. Um, like I said, there's already a review session posted. Uh, that you can watch video from from last semester. I think it's pretty decent. Um, it's probably about three hours long. Um, but I'm not going to go off of that. I'm just going to uh, review a few other things, okay? I think we've done pretty good job with the linear transformation stuff because it's been so recent. Maybe let's just go back a little bit, okay? So I'm going to throw a, a random problem on the board and let's see if we can work it out, okay? So uh, here it is. Here's my example. I'm going to take v to be the calculus functions defined on the interval from 0 to 1. 
okay? And then I'm going to define an inner product between two functions by using the integral from zero to one half of f of t, g of t, dt. So let's just take this as a proposal. And my question that I'm gonna ask you is whether or not that is a valid inner product. So is this a valid inner product? Okay, so let's think about this one. What I'm really asking in this question is I basically I'm just asking you guys to remember the inner product axioms and um, to think about whether they're true or not. Does anybody remember the four axioms? <laughs> um, well, in particular, do you remember what the first axiom says? Something about it has to be greater than or equal to zero. Exactly. The inner product of, Kenneth, you look like you wanted to say something. Do you have a? Yeah, about to say that greater than equal to zero for the first one. The second one should be the uh, switch part. Okay, right. So let me just start with the first one. Okay, but that you're absolutely right. The first one, the first axiom is this one. And everybody definitely wants to be uh, aware of this. So the inner product of a vector with itself always has to be at least zero. And the only way it can equal zero is if the vector itself was the zero vector. Now, I'm emphasizing this axiom. I'm specifically emphasizing this axiom because this is often the one that goes south. Uh, if something doesn't work, it's usually this axiom is the one that, that you want to look at. And so that's why I put it first in the list, because this is the one that can get you into trouble. So let's check it out uh, for this particular formula. So I have a formula here for this inner product. Let's check it out. What would be the inner product of f with itself. So we just look at the formula here. We're gonna do an integral from zero to one half of f of t squared dt, right? So the, the f and the g are both replaced with just f. So we get f of t squared for that. <clears throat> okay, can everybody read this okay? Is this good? Yeah, it's great. Yeah, is that gonna be greater than or equal to zero? Uh, equal to zero? I mean, an another way of saying it, is there in any way that this could come out negative? I don't when, think you, so. when you actually calculate that no. integral. David? I don't think so. You don't think so, why not? You're right. Was it the square? Exactly, yeah. the function f of t, when you square it, of course it becomes positive. So this integrand, which is f of t squared, is definitely positive. So for sure, this is greater than or equal to zero, okay? Now I have another question. This is the tricky part. Is there any way that that integral could come out equal to zero, even without the function being zero? In other words, I'm looking at the part over here in parentheses. So not only should this inner product with itself be greater than or equal to zero, the only way that we should be able to get actually equal to zero is if it was the zero vector that we were looking at. Any thoughts on that? This one is a little tricky because it, it turns out that this doesn't work because what gets us into trouble is look at the limits of this integral zero to one half. So I could imagine, I'm gonna draw a graph here. I could imagine having a function, just gonna draw a small little graph down here between zero and one. This is my y-axis, this is my x-axis. I'm gonna draw you a graph of a function right now. Here it is. So the function, I'm gonna draw it in blue. It goes from zero to one half right along the x-axis and then maybe goes up like that or something. 
let's suppose this is my function f. So if you are only looking at the interval from zero to one half, right? Between zero and one half, this function definitely has an integral of zero. So the thing is, this function, let me just make a note here, this function is not the zero function, right? Why is it not the zero function? Well, because look, when you look at the part of the graph between one half and one, it's definitely not zero. So as a function, this is not the zero function. The zero function should be like zero all the way along the whole x-axis forever, right? This function doesn't do that. So this function is not zero, but if you calculate the inner product of that function with itself, right, what is going to happen is you're going to get zero because you're only integrating, I'm just plugging in the formula, you're only integrating between zero and one half. And on that part of the x-axis, the function is in fact zero. So you get no area under that graph, right? The integral is zero. So this is kind of a cute example where it is true that the inner product is always greater than or equal to zero, but even for a non-zero function, we can get zero. And so it violates this part of the definition over here that I'm circling in blue on the right-hand side, okay? Any questions on that? Okay, um, make sure you also know the other axioms. Uh, there are three other axioms. Let me just remind you what they are here. You need to know these. Um, so let me grab my, my little marker here. So the second axiom, Kenneth, you were saying, this is the one where you switch the, uh, the vectors, and that's exactly right. So the inner product of x with y is the same as the inner product of y with x. We also know that we can pull constants out. That's the third axiom. So if I have a constant c, I can pull it out in front of the, uh, of the inner product notation. And then finally, the inner product actually respects addition. So we could have, say, x1 plus x2 inner product with y. Well, that's the same as the inner product of x1 with y plus the inner product of x2 with y. So it would look something like that. So these are your four axioms of an inner product. And I might ask you, uh, you know, to recall those during the exam and maybe to check uh, one or two of those or maybe ask you whether a proposed inner product works or not. That's something I want you to be able to do. Okay, any questions on that? So, Professor? Yeah, Kenneth. Yeah, um, yeah is the, did the first one, uh, did it fail or it, it pass? No, the, the first, so on this example, the first axiom did not pass. The thing is, Kenneth, you have to be a little careful. The first axiom has actually two parts to it, right? There's the, the first part of it, which just says the inner product of x with itself is at least zero. And then there's the second part in the parentheses, and that's the part that didn't work. Oh. Right? Okay. So I, I hope that's clear. So the first axiom actually has two parts to it, and you do need to be aware of both of them. Maybe it would have been better to list five axioms, <laughs> uh, but typically people do it this way. They just uh, lump those two things together in the first axiom. Okay. Um, all right, so that's pretty good uh, review of the inner product axioms. Um, let's go on and talk about another problem. Okay, so let's try this one. By the way, I'm gonna make this one up just right on the fly right now. <laughs> okay, so hopefully it, hopefully it comes out well. So here's an example. I'm gonna let V be the vector space P3 of R, and I'm gonna let S be the set of P of X in V 
such that p prime of 3 is equal to 1. So these are polynomials, cubic polynomials, right? Actually, I should be more careful. These are polynomials of degree 3 or less. So these could include quadratics or lines or just zero uh, constants, I should say. Um, so P3 of R is the polynomials of degree 3 or less. And this is S. And my question is, so S has the condition that the derivative, when you plug in 3, is equal to 1. And here's my question. Is S a subspace of V? So let's say I'm asking you to check if this S forms a subspace, right? So if I ask you that, normally, what's the thing that I usually like to do first? Do you remember? This goes back to chapter four now. Do you Close remember like we check? Pardon? Closure under addition and uh, a failure multiplication. Okay, so I, I caught that, Reza. You said closure under addition and closure under scalar multiplication. And that's absolutely right, except even before I do that, is there something we can do first that's even faster? The zero vector yeah. check? There we go, exactly. We can. You guys are great, but I love this Zoom thing. <laughs> you guys can chime in real easily, I love it. Yeah, the zero vector check. So we we should probably do that first because it can save us some time, right? Um, if the zero vector is not part of S, then we can just already say no and, the, and be done with it. So let's take a look here. The zero vector, so the zero vector check. So my zero vector would be this vector. So there's always going to be a zero vector. It's just a question of whether it's in S or not. Right, so the vector space V, the big vector space at the top, definitely has a zero vector. It's just this polynomial zero. If I drew a graph of that, if I drew a graph of that, the zero vector would look exactly like this, yeah? It's just a flat line going right along the X axis. So does that belong to S in this example? So to be in S, remember, what's the membership card? The membership card that we have to have here is that when I take the derivative of my function and then plug 3 into it, I'm supposed to get 1 for an answer. Does that happen with the 0 function? No. It definitely doesn't, does it, right? I mean, after all, take a look at the slope of this blue line. I don't know if you can see that very well. There's a bit of a glare, but that blue line that's on that picture has a slope that's always zero. So you're not gonna be able to say that P prime of three is equal to one because the slope there is always zero. So let me just say that this is not an element of S. Okay, you're gonna to wanna to write things like that down. Put a little slash through your element symbol. So this is not an element of S and therefore S is not a subspace. And you don't have to go on. You don't, at that point, you can stop. All right. Um, any questions on that one? OK, I'm going to edit this example and just slightly change it. OK, what I'm going to do, I hope you don't mind. I'm not going to rewrite the whole thing back up again um, in your notes. You may have to recopy what S is for yourself, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this P prime of 3 equal to 1. I'm going to change that to a 0, and I'm going to start all over again. So again, the only re it's just because I have a very small board here, and it's a little bit of a pain. I don't want to write, uh, rewrite the whole thing out all over again, um, so I apologize about that part of it, but hopefully you guys can, can jump in with me here. Uh, this is the same exact example, except now my condition is that P prime of three is equal to zero, and I'm gonna ask the same exact question. Okay, so the zero vector check. Um, 
So my polynomial is, is my zero vector is still the same line. Does that belong to S this time? Yes. Yeah, this time it does because the derivative of that blue line is always zero at no matter what pl point you plug in. So definitely this is an element of S this time. Okay, so it passes, this zero vector passes the zero vector check this time. Okay, now remember that does not guarantee that this is a subspace, right? Just because the zero vector is there is not enough to say that you have a subspace. We now have to think a little harder about whether we believe that this really will be closed under addition and scalar multiplication. And if we really believe that, then we have to try to check that, okay? Um, if you're not sure, this is kind of a thumbs up, thumbs down thing, right? You have to decide, is it a subspace or not? And you almost want to think about that before you start writing. Because if you write everything down and you realize, oh, it doesn't work, then you're you kind of have to erase everything and start over. So this is a good place to think about this a little bit. If I add two functions together, that are both flat at x equals three, right? The derivative being equal to zero just means that the graph is flat. If I add two graphs that are both flat at x equals three, and I do sort of vertical summation, will the resulting graph still be flat there? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Seems reasonable, doesn't it? Yeah, if you have two flat graphs and you add them together, it's gonna stay flat. Yeah, so closure under addition, it seems reasonable, but let's try to write it down. Let's try to write it down. So closure under addition. And by the way, guys, uh, just a little tip for the midterm. Let's say you're not real confident. You don't know whether it's a subspace or not. You're not quite sure. But if you give me some notes about closure under addition, closure under sc scalar multiplication, if you let me know that you understand what you have to do, I'll give you some partial credit for that, even if you don't actually do it, right? So uh, try your best to convey as much knowledge as you have. Um, even if you're not totally confident, you can get plenty of partial credit by telling me what part of the solution you do feel good about, okay? So maybe you don't know, but you at least know that you're supposed to check closure under addition, so you write that down. Okay, so let's go ahead and write this out. Is it necessary for me to write ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d right here? Do I need to write out the polynomial? I mean, actually, first of all, let me, let me clarify that. We really need two polynomials, right, for closure under addition. So let me write, let me just start off with some notation here. Let p of x comma q of x be elements of S. Okay, so this is how you would start off. My question is, do I need to write out P of X as AX cubed plus BX squared plus CX plus D, for example? It's, it's, a, it's an element of P3 of R. Do I need to write it all out that way? No, not really. Yeah, you really don't need to. The reason that you don't need to is really comes from the problem. If you look right here, see what I'm circling? That condition, that condition that is what is required for elements of S, that condition is expressed in this abstract form. We don't actually need to know the coefficients of the polynomial here. So all I need to write then is, I just need to say what this means. This just implies that P prime of three is equal to zero and q prime of three is equal to zero. You guys read that okay? I got a little bit crammed onto the far side of the board there, but that's the condition. P prime of three is zero and q prime of three is zero. Okay, awesome. So let me back that out again and set it down. Um, so then let's look at P plus Q. So then P plus Q of X 
actually what I want to know, I'm sorry, this isn't really what I want to do. I want to take the derivative of that and plug three into it. So again, there's a little bit of a glare there. Let me put that down for a moment. So we're looking at P plus Q. We're going to see whether it lives in S. How do we know? Well, we have to take the derivative of it and plug in three. So I'm going to try and do that now. Okay. Let me just see. Maybe I don't need that light on. That might actually be better. Okay. So let's try it without that, that glare. So this thing, of course, I can break this up. P prime of three plus Q prime of three. And that is just, that is just zero plus zero, which is zero. So P prime of three plus Q prime of three is equal to zero plus zero, which is equal to zero. So that is good. That means that P plus Q is an element of S. Okay. Now the thing is, I don't want you to just write element of S right here because we're not trying to say zero is an element of S. We're trying to say, let's actually give ourselves a little more room. We're trying to say that P plus Q is an element of S and then we can put our little check mark. Okay, so it's not that zero is an element of S right here. It's P plus Q that we want to focus on. Okay, so stop me if there's any question on this. This is all we have to do for the closure under addition. All right, let's look at the scalar multiplication part. Closure under scalar multiplication. Does anybody remember how to start writing this up? Let P of X be the same as above and then C uh, as an element of S. Great, let P of X be as above. And actually, if you don't mind, Ryuko, I'm gonna use a K because I think I usually was using a K for this. So K is a, is a real number, but yeah, you could use a C. It wouldn't matter what letter you actually chose to use. Um, but yeah, absolutely. So we take our polynomial as above and we grab a K, which is a scalar, and we're going to look at, so now the punchline is down here on the bottom line. We're going to take K times P. We're going to take its derivative and plug in three, right? This is the key thing is we're checking whether K times P is still in S. Okay, so let's work this out. A constant, right? Constants can always come out of derivatives. So I can just pull that out. It's just K times P prime of three. And P prime of three, again, we can go back to the assumption here. P prime of three is just zero. So that is just K times zero, which is zero. All right, and that tells me that tells me that we got what we wanted. So I'm gonna put a little, little arrow. K times P is an element of S. All right. That makes some sense. Anybody have a question on that? Okay, fantastic. Well, uh, if this is a subspace, so the answer now is yes. S is a subspace of V. So now I'm going to ask you for a follow-up question. Does anybody know what I'm going to ask? <laughs> Once I have a subspace in my hands, then I'm going to ask a question because I, I have another thing I could maybe want to find out. So I'm going to ask a follow-up. Does anybody know what it is? Is it the basis? Or you Exactly. I'm going to ask you to give me a basis and the dimension for S. So let's put that down. Very good. That's exactly right. So follow up. Follow up. Find a basis slash dimension for S. So as soon as you have a Something that is a subspace, remember a subspace is just a vector space, right? It's just a vector space within a larger vector space. So as soon as you have that, I can ask you 
anything I could ask you about a vector space. So I could ask you to tell me um, a basis for it because that's a very important concept. By the way, uh, the original vector space V up at the top, what's the dimension of that? What's the, what's the dimension of P3 of R? Does anybody remember the dimension of P3 of R? Is it four? Yeah, it's four. In fact, uh, in general, let's just make sure. Make sure that you guys know these, uh, some of these very common dimensions. The dimension of Pn of R is always just n plus one. Okay, is the, is the text coming through okay on the video there? Let me see if I can. Yeah, okay, that seems to be reasonable. Um, okay, so this is, this is a good formula to make sure that you know. And you should also know the dimensions of Rn, uh, Mn of R, M, M by N of R, right? All of those sort of classic standard vector spaces. You want to make sure that you know the dimensions of those things, okay? Um, but let's, uh, in this case, we know that the dimension of V is four. So could anybody tell me, even before we dive into this uh, follow-up question, will the dimension of S be more than four, equal to four, or less than four? Does anybody have a theory about that? It's a subspace, right? So if you have a subspace of V, and V itself was four-dimensional, Remember, a subspace is smaller, right? The subspace is inside of V. So that suggests to me that the dimension of S, I would expect it to be less than four. We should hopefully come up with a dimension that's less than four, okay? But let's see what happens. Let's see, let's see what the dimension actually, actually is here, okay? So for the solution, now guys, this is actually the place where we need to write out the polynomial. If we're gonna get a basis for S, we're gonna to need to write out the polynomial here. So let me actually just do that. I'm gonna write it out. It's just, what is it? It's AX cubed plus BX squared plus CX plus D, right? I just wanna put the form. This is like, now this is not the form of a polynomial in S, but this is at least the form of a vector in V. It's a cubic polynomial. Anybody have any suggestions what I might wanna do with that uh, expression that I've written down at this point to, to sort of start talking about S? Look at the thing I have circled up there, right? In order to belong to S, when I take the derivative, of this polynomial and plug in three, I'm supposed to get zero. So that seems like something safe to do, right? Let's take this form of this polynomial, let's differentiate it and plug in three. Clear enough? Does that seem reasonable? Let's just, let's just see what it would be. So P prime of X, the derivative, well that's three A X squared, plus 2bx plus c. So I start by taking the derivative of that, and now I'm going to plug in 3 into the x. So I'm plugging in for the x here. So 3 times a times 3 squared, that's going to be 27a. And then when I plug in 3 for x here, I get 6b, and then plus c. And I'm going to set that equal to 0 right? Because I, I know that that's the condition for a polynomial to be in S. This last equal sign here, this last little, let me put it in a box, that little expression actually is an equation. It's a, it's a linear equation. I could literally make a matrix out of it, right? 27 times A, six times B, one times C, and I'm not gonna forget about D, and I'm augmenting it with zero. 
you sort of can build this little matrix if you want to. You don't really have to do this, but it's kind of nice to connect the ideas here. And what you see is that you have a pivot position there. You have a pivot position, but notice that B, C, and D, right? So this is the B column, the C column, and the D column. Those are all free variables. I can make B, C, and D to be whatever I want. It doesn't matter as long as the A cancels it all back out again. So what I'm going to do is I'm literally going to take this equation in the, in the box there and solve it for A. I'm going to move everything to the other side of the equation and solve it for A. So I'm going to get what? I'll get negative 6 over 27B minus 1 over 27C. This would be the expression for A. Oops, sorry. So that is what A is. Okay, is everybody with me? Stop me if there's any question here. I see a couple of you have your microphones out. I don't know if you want to say anything or you're just. Oh, so this is Matt. Yeah, Matt, what's up? Okay, so this is the basis that we're solving for? Or? I'm, yeah, I'm not done yet, but I'm trying to find a basis for S. Okay, okay. So I'll, I was just confused what we're doing. What we're doing, yeah. I'm just doing this little follow-up question. Find a basis for S. So I'm writing down the polynomial. I'm using the condition that P prime of three is supposed to equal zero, and that's allowing me to solve for my leading variable A. I'm not done yet, oh. but that's, that's where we're at so far. Okay, thank you. Okay, anybody else have a question so far? Or are we okay? Okay, let's keep going. What are we gonna do next? I'm gonna actually erase the top part here because I think by now everybody pretty much has the, the question down. So what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna come back to my P of X and I'm literally gonna sub in what the A was. So this is negative six over 27 B minus one over 27 C all times X cubed, right? And then plus B X squared plus C X plus D. So there is your polynomial. That is, so anything that's in, um, S looks like that, right? It has to have that form. Okay, so does anybody have an idea how I'm going to get my basis now? I think you do. We have the form of our vectors in S, right? It looks like that form right there at the top of this board. You bust out the variables? That's the one, that's exactly right. We're going to bust out the variables. So we take we, out the, the B's and the C's, right? Not the X's? Exactly, we have to take out the, the B, the C, and the D here. So we have three variables to take out. So let's do that, exactly. I'm gonna bust out the B. So when I bust out the B, let's look at what we get. Here's a B right here. Okay, the very first term. I have negative 6 over 27 is a coefficient, and then that's times x cubed. And then there's also a b next to that x squared. So I'm going to bracket that x squared inside the brackets as well. So this is just factoring the b out. And then I have to do the same thing with the c. When I bust out the c, I have negative 1 over 27 times x cubed, right? So the coefficient is negative one over 27. I have an x cubed there. I also have a c over here in the x term. So sorry, that should be plus x. And we put a bracket around that part. And then I'm gonna actually bust out the d as well. Uh, but when I bust out the d, the only thing that's left is a one there, right? So, that is exactly right. The, the, the strategy for finding a basis, guys, is first to write down the form of your polynomial, which is what the top line is, and then secondly, to bust out the variables, which is what the second line is. Okay, so that's what we have there. And then uh, can anybody tell me what my base, how I'm gonna get my basis now? My basis, right? My basis is just those 
polynomials that are in the brackets. So negative 6 over 27 times x cubed plus x squared, comma, negative 1 over 27 x cubed plus x, comma, 1. Okay, so there is your basis for s. It's not the only basis, but it is a basis that you could use. And what would be the dimension of this? What's the dimension? Three. Three. Yep, exactly. It's just three because I have three vectors there. So that confirms my, that, that sort of confirms my suspicion from earlier that I was saying is that, oh, well, the dimension should be less than four, right? The whole cubic polynomial world has a dimension of four. We would expect this dimension to be less. Actually, something that's uh, kind of interesting uh, is that, so remember, we had one condition uh, that p prime of three was supposed to equal zero. Each time you add another condition, the dimension of s actually will go down by one, right? Because every time you throw another condition in there, your subspace gets smaller, right? And so you lose dimension every time there's more conditions. So in this case, we had one condition and the dimension dropped, um, the dimension dropped down by one from the dimension of v. Okay, uh, so far so good? Everybody good with this example? It's a great two-part question. I ask you, is it a subspace or not? Uh, if yes, find me a basis in the dimension. If no, tell me why not, right? And, and those, those make really good questions. So the, the, there'll be more practice like that in the, in the sample exam too. Okay, if there's no questions here, I'm gonna erase this and maybe I'll try and think of I'll think of one or two more problems we can do today to practice a little bit more. Okay, let's go ahead and do another problem. Okay, we'll just, this is just review. That's all we're doing is reviewing for our midterm. So for example, um, I'm going to let V be equal to um, let's, let's do two by two matrices this time. So we'll take a, an example that's got um, square matrices, two by two. And I'm going to let S be the span of, I'm gonna make some matrices here. Let's use one, 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 one. And then I'll use, uh, let's say four, negative two, three, six. And then I'll make another one, which will be, oh, let's say um, seven, one, six, nine. And then let's make one more that's uh, maybe negative one, um, five, zero, and negative three. Okay, so let's, uh, let's just play with the, an, an example that has matrices in it here to practice a little bit. Uh, what I'm gonna ask you this time is, I'm gonna ask you again, is S a subspace of V? And we'll do that first. Is S a subspace of V? Does anybody have any thoughts on that? Need to check linear independency. Uh, so David, good good thought. We're going to get to that. That's actually going to come up a little bit later. But before I even get into that level of detail, does somebody know check? very quickly Wait, whether this is a subspace or not? Ryoko, is there a vector check? Okay. Normally we would start with the zero vector check. Um, in this case, guys, because believe it or not, time, there's right? an even faster reason. Because it's a span, it is a subspace. Yes, that's what I was looking for. Guys, remember that any time you take the span of anything, I don't care what it is, it will always automatically be a subspace. You can just say that um, and you can just, so you might just say something like, 
uh, yes, like how would you write this on your paper? You might say, yes, since S is a span um, of vectors. This would be a very, very quick answer, right? That's totally correct. So remember what the span of a set of vectors is. It's just all linear combinations of those vectors. And by doing that, by taking all linear combinations of a set of vectors, what you end up with is something that will always be closed under addition and scalar multiplication. Is that clear to everybody? So this is like a freebie. If you see something on the test where you see the word span there, it's like, boom, that's automatically a subspace. Okay. Now, let me ask a follow-up again. Let's try to find a basis and the dimension of this, okay? So follow-up. Find a basis slash dimension for S, okay? So let's try and do that. Will these four matrices, I've got four matrices here, will those be a basis? Can we just take that as the basis? No, I think. It's not quite that easy, is it? What could go wrong? What would be wrong with just taking the four matrices that are given there and calling that your basis? Yeah, repeats or they're not, right? Linearly uh, independent. That's it, that's it. The vectors, remember for a basis, not only do the vectors have to span the space, they have to be linearly independent as well. These vectors, these four matrices here, they definitely span S because S is the span of those vectors, right? So almost by definition of how S was created, right? The four matrices that you see on the board are definitely a spanning set. But the question is, are they linearly independent? So we should check that. Okay, so I'm going to check I'm going to check linear independence right here, okay? So remember uh, how we do that, right? This has been back to chapter four. What we have to do is put our vectors into the columns of a matrix. So the first vector, which is one, 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 that first matrix, I'm just going to lay it out as a column. So one, 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 and one. The second matrix, I'm gonna put it in the second column, four, negative two, three, and six. The third one is seven, one, six, and nine. And the fourth one is negative one, five, zero, and negative three. And can somebody remind me, when I'm checking linear independence, what do I augment this matrix with what's the column I need to put on the far right? Zero. That's right, exactly. It has to be all zero. So let's try that. I'm going to put all zero here. Okay, great. So this is the setup of this. Um, so in the case when your coefficient matrix is a square matrix, we could just figure this out by taking the determinant. I mean, anytime you have a square matrix, you know, one of the things that comes into my mind is, oh, now I have, have a determinant that I could, could use. Uh, in this case, it's kind of a pain to do the determinant of this four by four matrix because it doesn't have a lot of nice numbers in it. There are very few zeros in this matrix. So I'm gonna propose that it's just as easy as anything else to just do a couple of row operations, okay? So I'm gonna just, uh, this is the first time in a while we've actually worked out any row operations, but I'm going to add the negative of the first row to all of the other three rows. So I don't have a massive amount of room here. I should have planned ahead a little bit better, um, but I'm gonna try to squeeze it in here. So we have one, four, seven, negative one. When I take the negative of the first row and add it to the second row, I get zero, negative 10, I'm sorry, uh, zero, negative six, and then 
negative six and then six and then zero. Okay, um, correct me if I make any mistake here because I'm actually literally winging this problem. <laughs> I just made, made it up on the spot, right? So if I take the negative of the first row and add it to the third row, I'll get zero, negative one, negative one, one, and zero. And if I take the negative of the first row and add it to the last row, I'll get zero, two, two, negative two, and zero. And do you see what's happening here? The, the second, third, and fourth rows, if you look at what I have on the far right, I know it's a little bit tight to see that. But do you agree the second, third, and fourth rows, they're basically all the same? So what that means, I mean, they're all multiples of each other. So if I were to continue doing EROs, right, if I continue doing EROs here, what's going to happen is you're going to zero out some rows. Now, a mistake that I sometimes see people do in a situation like this is they cross off all three, <laughs> all three of those last three rows. You don't want to do that. Just cross off two of them. So you have to save one of them. It doesn't really matter. I'm just going to cross off the two that are on the bottom. All that we really care about here, guys, are the pivot positions, the pivot positions. I don't care about rows of zeros. What I care about are columns and pivots. And what you'll notice here on this example is that I have pivots in the first two columns. So are these vectors, are they LI or are they LD? LD. Exactly. LD. They're Exactly right. Yes, they are LD. Very good. That's because we have two free variables. The third and fourth variables are free. So how do we then, if they're LD, then they're not going to be a basis. So if we want to get a basis now for S, we need to remove the vectors that are causing the trouble. And what vectors are those? Those are going to be the vectors that are corresponding to the unpivoted columns. So if I got rid of the third and fourth columns of my matrix, then I would have no free variables anymore. And that would be what we want, right? So if I just go back and I say, all right, I'm gonna get rid of the third and fourth columns, that's really just saying I'm going to cross off the third and fourth matrix. And so my basis here, I'll just write the answer over here in this corner, my basis is 1, 1, 1, 1, and 4, negative 2, 3, 6. That is your basis for your set S. Okay, let me just turn that a little bit. Any question on that? Does that make sense, how we did that? We removed the last two vectors because those vectors corresponded to free variables that showed up when we did this row reduction process. What's the dimension of S? What is the dimension of my space going to be? Anybody? Two? Yeah, it's just two, right? Can everybody hear me all right? Yeah, so it's just it's just the number of sorry, it's just the number of vectors that I have in my basis, which is just two. So be a little careful on a problem like this, guys. Four matrices were given, but it doesn't mean that they form a four-dimensional space. The dimension turns out to only be two, and that's because only two of those matrices were linearly independent. Okay, so I'm going to ask you another follow-up question now. Unless there's, well, before I do that, are there any questions on this follow-up? Does everybody understand how I got my basis and my dimension here? Okay, if so, I'm going to ask one more follow-up. Let me see, what did I do? Here's my eraser. I'm going to ask one more follow-up. Um, where can I write this down? Um, let me just put it right up at the top. I'll start, I'll just put my second follow-up way up here. And what this is, is write a linear dependency. 
um, among the vectors. Let's try to write an actual, so we now know that the four matrices are LD. They are linearly dependent. Let's see if we can actually write down a linear dependency among those vectors, okay? So this is something else that we did back in chapter four, so I thought it might be worth, worth looking at this. Um, and we've actually already done most of the work that we have to do to, to, to solve this. So see, the idea, guys, is that in this, I know I've written a lot of stuff over this over here, but in this last matrix here, right, the columns of this, of this matrix, those correspond to C1, C2, C3, and C4. We have constants, right, that are being multiplied onto each of our four matrices. So what we know at this point is, just erase a little bit more here. I'm going to go ahead and erase this basis and dimension too. I am recording this session, so if you ever want to go back and, and hear it again or, or think about it a little bit more, uh, you'll definitely be able to do that um, if you've lost track of any of these notes. But the point is that we can, we can figure this out pretty easily now. So C3 and C4, those are both free. Those are both free variables because there's no pivots. There's no pivots in the third and fourth columns. Okay, now what about C2? Well, maybe I'll actually just use this middle row, for example. Negative C2 minus C3 plus C4 is supposed to add up to zero. That's coming from this uh, third row here. Neg I know it's a little hard to read now. Negative C2 minus C3 plus C4 adds up to zero. So if you solve for C2, if you solve for C2, it's going to be negative C3 plus C4. So let's write that down over here. C2 is negative R plus T, okay? And then I have to, and stop me if there's any question on that, all right? negative r plus t, and then I'm going to figure out what is c1. This is the hard one. So I know that c1 plus 4c2, I'm going right across the first row, 4c2 plus 7c3 minus c4 adds up to zero. So I have to solve for c1 now using that equation. So c1, I'll put it right here, C1 is, what is it? It's negative four times C2, which I'm gonna replace negative R plus T. And then it's minus seven times C3, which was R, and then plus C4, which is T. This can be uh, simplified a little bit. This is actually, uh, let's see, four R minus seven R, that's negative three R. And then I have negative 4t plus t, which is negative 3t. Okay, so I'm trying, to, again, what am I doing? I'm trying to write the linear dependency. That's the question up at the top of the board. So I've written down what c1, c2, c3, and c4 are. And it's all coming from solving this system by back substitution. It goes back to chapter two, right? Way back to, to early on in the semester. What I have to do now, guys, is to create a, a linear dependency, I need to choose specific numbers for R and T. Does anybody have a suggestion what numbers to choose? Or maybe you wanna say something about what numbers not to choose? Don't choose zero. Don't choose zero, that's right, Kenneth, exactly. If you choose R and T to be zero, it's going to mess everything up because then you're just going to get all of your constants to be zero and that's not going to give you a linear dependency. So you just need to choose something that's not zero, but there's lots of right answers here. You can do lots of things. You can say, let's choose T equal to one, maybe. Again, I'm just making that up. That's not the only choice. 
Uh, and I also have to choose a value for R. You know, if you, as long as you choose T equal to one, it is actually okay to choose R to be zero. By choosing R to be zero, you're just not going to have the third vector in your linear dependency. C3 will be zero, but that's okay. Not every vector in your set has to be a part of your linear dependency. That, that's not a requirement. So uh, let's just choose T to be equal to one. Then what do we get here? Well, we get uh, C1 equal to negative three, C2 equal to one, C3 equal to zero, and C4 equal to one. Okay, so that's what you end up getting. And now let's actually write down the dependency that comes out of that. Okay, so what do we conclude? Well, C1 is negative three times the first matrix, right? Plus the second matrix with a one in front of it plus the fourth matrix, which also has a one in front of it. And all of that should cancel out to zero, 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 zero. <coughs> okay. Um, and you can check that it works. So this is what a linear dependency is. Okay, that's a linear dependency. Are there any questions on that? So on the surface of it, it looks like you would have spent $4,000 to come up with a spanning set for S. But because there are these linear dependencies lurking among those vectors, you can get away cheaper, right? We were able to do it with just two vectors, $2,000 in other words, right? So um, keep that in mind. I'm not, not always just interested in spanning my space. I also want to do it in a linearly independent fashion. Okay, I think I have time for one more problem, unless there's a question on this one, then maybe we'll just do one more sort of theoretical problem from chapter four, and then I think I'll call it good for this session anyway. Any questions so far? Okay, let's do one more problem. It should only take like five minutes, and then we'll, we'll wrap things up. I want to make sure that um, that you guys really understand linear independence, um, not just be able to go through the motions of putting it into a matrix and, and solving it that way. I want to make sure that you guys can actually, you know, uh, understand conceptually what is going on. So this problem will be a good way to sort of uh, practice that. All right. So here's an example. Here's an example. Suppose that I have three vectors. This is an abstract, this is like a conceptual problem. Let's take three vectors u, v, w, and let's suppose that this is li. Okay, suppose you have three vectors that are li. I would like to show, so this is kind of like a proof, I would like to show that the vector uh, u plus 2v plus 3w comma 3u plus 4v comma uh, 5v plus 6w is li. So this is a little more abstract of a problem because the vectors, we don't know what they are. They could be polynomials, they could be matrices, they could be anything. It's been expressed very abstractly. So this is a good chance to kind of review what linear independence really means sort of conceptually. What linear independence means conceptually is that the only way to cancel your vectors out in a linear combination, I'm gonna say this very slowly because the definition itself is a little bit slippery, right? 
Linear independence means the only way that you can cancel out your set of vectors into a linear combination and get it canceling out to zero is by cheating and putting zero coefficients in front of all of those vectors, right? And that's what you wanna show here about these three vectors on the second line, is that the only way that you can cancel them out is by throwing zeros in front of them, right? Of course, if you throw zeros in front of a, a bunch of vectors, you're gonna cancel everything out. But what we're trying to show is that, yeah, that's the only way you can do it. Let's try that. How, is, how does it look on a, on a write-up? Well, this, is, this is the part I wanna make sure everybody can write something like this up, okay? What you need to do is you need to assume that you have a linear combination of your three vectors that cancels out. And don't make the mistake of using the original vectors. We're not gonna start with the original set at the top. We're gonna start with the vectors that we are interested in. So let's assume that C1 times U plus 2V plus 3W plus C2 times the quantity 3U plus 4V that's a V, plus C3 times the quantity 5V plus 6W. Let's assume that all of that cancels out to zero. Sorry, I had to squeeze that in over here. Let's assume that that equals the zero vector. This is, this is already going to get you like a third of the partial credit to just write the first line correctly, right? For linear independence, you just set up a linear combination of your vectors and suppose it equals zero. And then what you want to show, I'm gonna write this down just so we know where we're headed. We want to show that all of those constants are zero. The only way to cancel out these three vectors is to cheat and to put zeros in front of all three of them. That's what we're really proving here. Now, of course, at some point, we're gonna use the fact that the original three vectors are already Li. What that means is that if I ever come across a linear combination of the original vectors, U, V, and W, that cancels out, then whatever those coefficients are will have to be zero, okay? But we don't have that yet. We're starting with this fairly complex expression right now. Does anybody have a suggestion what I might wanna do with that expression? Can I reorganize it somehow? Put the terms differently? I have an Can idea. Distribute? Yeah, we, we could multiply it out, right? We could multiply it out. And then what I'm going to do, I'm going to kind of do that along with one other thing. I can group together all of the terms that involve U, and then I can group together all of the terms that involve V, and then all of the terms that involve W. It's just regrouping the terms here, okay? So I'm just going to say rearranging... Let's look at where we see the U. Well, I have a C1 in front of the U right here, and I have a 3C2 in front of the U right there. So C1 plus 3C2 is being multiplied by U. Okay, what about V? Where are all the V terms? I've got 2C1 at the beginning, and then I've got 4C2, and then I've got 5C3. And all of that is times V. And I ran a little short on room, so I'll add one more line down here. Finally, where are all of my W terms? Well, I, at the very beginning, I have 3C1 times W. And at the very end, I have 6C3. And all of that is times W. So what I'm doing, I still have 0 on the right side. What I did there is I just grouped the U terms together, the V terms together, and the W terms together. And look what we have. <laughs> look what we have, guys. We have 
a linear combination of U, V, and W now that is canceling out. This is where we can use the, the assumption at the beginning, right? The original three vectors, U, V, and W, are Li. The only way to cancel those guys out is by throwing zeros in front of all of the terms. So in other words, in other words, since we're almost done, we're just about done. This is the last thing we're going to do. Since UVW is Li, right, then all of these coefficients, let me circle them here. All of these coefficients, they're all zero. C1 plus 3C2, that equals zero. And so does the next coefficient, 2C1 plus 4C2 plus 5C3. That's also zero. And the last term, 3C1 plus 6C3, that's also zero. We actually get a system of equations here. Isn't that great? We get a system of equations. And with this system of equations that I put in the box there, all we want to do, remember what we're trying to do, we're trying to show that C1, C2, and C3 are all zero. At this point, we can just put this into a, this system into a matrix and solve it out, right? So let me just do that real fast and then we'll be done. We've, we've done all of the hard part. We just have to make a matrix here. One, three, zero, augmented with zero. Two, four, five, augmented with zero. Three, zero, six, augmented with zero. And I just have to solve that. Um, and then I'll be done. Actually, one thing that you could do, because it's a square matrix, it's three by three, right? The coefficient matrix is three by three. You could just take the determinant of it. And remember, if the determinant of this matrix is zero, then it means that you only have the trivial solution. You'll get exactly what you want down here. Let's do that. Let's take the determinant of this. So the determinant, instead of doing, you can do row operations if you want. It's okay, you can row reduce it. But I'm just gonna take the determinant, let's just call this capital A. I'll just use the arrow method just to do this kind of quickly here. We're gonna just take this little three by three and use the arrow method. The first arrow is 24, the second arrow is 45, the third arrow is zero, the fourth and fifth arrows are also zero, and the last one is 36. Now the point is, the point is that that determinant is not zero. It means your matrix is invertible. Actually, I'm glad that I did it this way because it gives me a chance to remind you about one more thing. We have an invertible matrix, right? Well, we know a lot about invertible matrices. And this is a good chance for me to remind you guys to please go to the back cover of your book and look up that invertible matrix theorem. One of the items in the list, I don't know if you're gonna be able to see this on my screen, do you see where it talks about the null space? Part I says that the null space of an invertible matrix is just zero, right? So I haven't talked a lot today about null space, row space, and column space. You definitely are gonna to want to spend some time reviewing that. In this case, this matrix has a trivial null space, right? The null space is trivial. In other words, the only solution to that linear system is that all of my constants are zero. So this was a good chance for me to make a connection with something else that we learned earlier. So we've shown linear independence. So what we needed to show was that all of those constants were zero and we did it by setting up that matrix and noticing that it has only the trivial solution. The null space is totally trivial. For an invertible matrix, the null space will always be zero. The row space and column space, by contrast, will always be the whole Rn, in this case, R3, right? So for an invertible matrix, the, the null space is tiny, but the row space and column space are huge, okay? 
So I'm talking a lot here. Um, I just want to make sure everybody's receiving it and, and following it. Are there any questions on what we've said here so far? If we were to reduce it rather than do the determinant, what were you looking for? You know what? If you had row reduced it, what would have happened? What would be the rank of this matrix? If the nullity is zero, right? So I just got through saying for an invertible matrix, the nullity would be zero. What would the rank of the matrix be? Three. Three, exactly. Which means that if you actually row reduced it, if you actually row reduced it, you would get, so your, your matrix would end up like that. And you would have, you would have no free variables. Right. So that's what that's what would happen. Remember, when you get no free variables in this row echelon form of your matrix, it means that your original vectors that you put into those columns are Li. Right. Um, this is exactly the opposite of what happened in, in our last example, where we had the third and fourth columns unpivoted and that created a linear dependency here you'll get no linear dependencies at all because you have no unpivoted columns to assign free variables to. Okay, and that's, this is exactly what would have happened if we had row reduced that matrix. Does that make sense, Ryoko? Yep, makes sense, thank you. Great, you bet. you bet. Does anybody else have any questions on this one? Okay, I actually feel really good about all these extra problems that we got to do today. Uh, it's kind of a little bonus. Um, to help you think about the midterm. These are exactly the kind of concepts that, that you need to be thinking about. Um, like I said, I've got a review session. You can watch that. You'll see a lot more examples. Uh, make sure you do save some time for yourself, that you have time to really try to solve some problems on your own. It's one thing to listen to me explain everything, right? And it can make sense sort of hearing my voice, but I also want you to save time. You know, take that sample test, and try it out on your own, see how it goes. Uh, maybe go back, redo a few of the group works. Uh, that might not be a bad thing to do. Um, there's some practice pro extra practice problems in the, re in the review packet as well. Um, so sure, go ahead, watch the review session, re keep reviewing the stuff we've gone over, uh, but do make sure that you allow yourself some time to, to let this stuff percolate a little bit. Um, I think that's all I've got for today. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna end this uh, session and then probably take me about five minutes. I'm gonna show up over in my office hour meeting room, which is that it's a different room number. Um, so you have to look that one up. I, I'm, I'm gonna post these on my website. I absolutely need to do that. Um, but anyway, uh, I'm gonna go over to my office hours in case anybody does have more questions. You can talk to me over there. Um, I'll be there later today, uh, might, might be there a little bit tomorrow, uh, but then also on Thursday morning. So does anybody have any questions before we go? So when we cover chapter four to 6.1? Correct, exactly. The exam covers uh, all of chapter four, except for 4.7, which we didn't cover, as well as 5.1 through 5.3, and then 6.1, yes. And the review packet kind of goes through what are all the topics from those sections, kind of gives you an overview of the things that you should be able to do, right? And um, then, there, as I said, there's some practice problems there as well, so. Okay, I'm gonna let you guys go. Thank you guys for coming today. I know this was kind of an optional session, but I'm going to save this recording and uh, you can tell your friends to watch it. There's definitely some good examples here. And I'll see you either in office hours or I'll see you Thursday uh, through Zoom for our, for our midterm. Okay, so bye for now. Professor.